there was just a, an absolutely remarkable piece in the New York Times over the last, uh, it was published yesterday, February 25th, and that, that had it, just a number of things in it that I thought were so vitally important to, to discuss and, and, and some issues as well um, around these facts that I wanted to get the author on. He is Professor Douglas Edgerton, Professor of History at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, the author of He Shall Go Out Free, The Lives of Denmark Vesey, and his latest book, The Wars of Reconstruction, The Brief Violent History of America's Most Progressive Era, the university website lemoyne.edu, and his Twitter is at Douglas Edgerton, E-G-E-R-T-O-N. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Dave, for having me. Thanks for joining us. This, this, uh, uh, it's really the, the headline, by the way, if people want to look it up on the New York Times, is Abolitionist or Terrorist. We'll have a link to it on our website, too, at TomHartman.com. And it starts out telling the story of Denmark Vesey, the, uh, correct me if I'm mispronouncing it, a uh, black abolitionist who, was ex- who uh, as you know, was executed in 1822 for leading a failed slave rebellion. Tell us the story of Denmark Vesey. Um, he's, a, he's a really amazing guy. He was born on uh, the island of St. Thomas, and when he was very young, he was purchased by a Bermuda-based uh, slave ship captain named Joseph Vesey. And, and, and about what time was that? What year? What's that? What year? Uh, what? Around 1767. Okay. You know, like, like most, of course, ex-slaves, no one, you know, he doesn't know exactly when he was born. Uh, the captain sort of guessed around 1767. Right. There was before the American Revolution. Yes, yes, yes. And... Um, and so, and so uh, then the boy was sold to um, San Deman, modern day Haiti, and he was obviously a really clever kid. At this point, he's about eleven years old, and um, it's it's the worst place to be a slave on the planet. You know what's now Haiti, the sugar sugar cane. So he pretends to have epilepsy, um, and, and so he's he's damaged property. So when the captain comes back with another consignment of slaves, he has to take the child back, and of course the the Epilepsy probably stops, and, and the captain's no fool, and, and so realizes this is a very smart kid. He uses him as a cabin boy. Um, then in 1783, uh, the British evacuate Charleston. Uh, the easy sets up shop there as, um, as a chandler and importer of nautical goods, and he uses uh, the boy he renames uh, Telemach, or, or probably becomes Denmark. Denmark. Um, it's, it's sort of a man Friday and domestic slave, and um, they had lotteries in those days, just like we have today. And so in 1799, he won $1,500, which is a lot of money. Um, and the Charleston uh, East Bay Lottery bought his freedom, but evidently was not able to buy his wife, who belonged to a different man. And, and so he became free, uh, but his family remained uh, enslaved and became a very uh, industrious carpenter uh, for 22 years in the city of Charleston. was well-known to everybody. Um, very big man, very proud person, um, married again, uh, and was able to buy that wife's freedom. Uh, but finally, it is in his mid-50s, which is a real old age in a slave society. Um, average life expectancy for black males in Annabelle, America, was 33 years. Oh. Uh, so his, his followers called him the, the old man. And um, uh, the, the city kept closing down the Amy Church, of which he was a, a lay minister and a very important person, and um, he thought about uh, leaving and going to Liberia, but um, that would mean leaving behind the, the enslaved children for his first marriage, and um, so he decided to stay and, and uh, orchestrated what probably was the largest slave conspiracy in, in North American history, and paid for that with his life. And, and, was, and was thus executed in 1822. And, and I think that... Yeah, yeah, and, and, I'm sorry? Along with 34 others. Along 34 with 34 people. others who participated in this conspiracy with him. And, and the conspiracy, in part, was to, uh, you know, wake up in the middle of the night, kill your white masters, and uh, make it to the harbor, as it were. And now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, and now you've got uh, uh, a statue to him has been put up in Charleston, South Carolina, and the, the right-wing talk radio guys are just going nuts about this. Yeah. Um, and uh, and this was you were giving a t- you talk about in your article about how uh, you know more than a decade ago you were giving a talk in Charleston, and a member of the audience said you know why didn't this guy just work within the system to get liberated or you know uh, or stage a protest march, <laughs> and and this 
told you how ignorant Americans are about what the circumstances of slavery actually were. You want to riff on that? We've, we've got about three minutes here. In fact, two years before his conspiracy in 1822, South Carolina had passed a law that, that flatly banned private manumissions, which, which allowed masters, if they wished, to, to free their slaves. And so, and again, that's how he you know, bought his, his own freedom. So the state, the state simply bans that. So even if you just want to free your slave or let your slave buy his or her freedom, that, that's not going to be illegal, meaning the only way now to become free, you either accept your fate or, or you pick up a sword. Um, and, and so, yeah, this was a well-intentioned gentleman, but he said, you know, well, why not work within the system? But, but you know, there was no system, and we need to understand that. Um, Deasy was a tough guy. He was a tough, hard man. He lived to a ripe old age in, in two slave societies, you know, mm-hmm. the Caribbean and South Carolina, which at the time was 61% black. Um, without developing some pretty thick skin. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the plan is to rise up on, on uh, July 14, as the bells told midnight, or because church bells, of course, all over Charleston. It's best deal day. Um, slay the masters and, and head to the docks and get on boats and get, get out, get to Haiti. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I've encountered, I've spoken a lot in Charleston over the years, and I've encountered people like the gentleman in the audience who said, well, you know, but, but he seems to be indifferent to the death of, of non-combatants. You know, this is a guy whose children are owned by the people. Right, the non-combatants uh, being the white slave owners, but uh, the, the person is ignorant of the violence that the slave owners were perpetrating on the slaves on a daily basis. There was, there was it, it, it fell down in the late 19th century. There was a jail-like structure called the workhouse in Charleston where you could send your slaves, if, if they were, especially domestic slaves, if they were misbehaved, you could send them down there with, with about a quarter and have them beaten by, by the workhouse uh, whipsmen. Um, and because it was in, in kind of the heart of Charleston, they wanted to baffle the sound, so, so residents couldn't hear the screams. And so the walls were six feet thick, and they were baffled with, with sand to, kind of, to sort of deaden the noise. And so that was, that was the world of Denmark. Easy. So to suggest that he should have been Mohandas Gandhi is it, simply to kind of yank the context out of the American past um, and, and not really understand what he did and, uh, and people like him were up against in, in the American South. It's remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. And, and why is it, do you think, in the minute we have left, that so many Americans, particularly white Americans, are completely unaware of the, of the extent of you know, the horrific violence that was associated with slavery? You know, living up to an unhappy past, and it's true for the North as well. I mean, I teach in upstate New York. Most of my students are, are blissfully unaware that we had slavery in New York State until 1827, that there were two major slave conspiracies in Manhattan, 1712, 1741. Um, you know, sort of looking, looking at, at our kind of national mirror and, and, and understanding what our past is, it's, that's tough to do. It's, it's easier to kind of pat ourselves on the back and, and focus on the, the undeniably good things, you know, fighting the Nazis, um, and, and sort of facing up to the really awful moments in the American past that, that made us the way we are today is, is pretty tough for a society to do. Yeah, yeah. It seems that 12 Years a Slave is taking us, you know, one step closer to that, but even that, so. even that really didn't portray the, you know, all the horrors of this institution. Um, remarkable. Uh, Professor Douglas Edgerton, his, uh, his book is, is titled uh, a brief, uh, The Wars of Reconstruction, The Brief Violent History of America's Most Progressive Era, and, be- and which I'd love to talk with you about another time. And before that, He Shall Go Free, The Lives of Denmark Vesey, and the new, new article in the New York Times, Abolitionist or Terrorist. Hang on just a second, sir. This is the Tom Hartman Sorry, program. that guy always comes in and steps on me. Uh, Professor <laughs> D- Douglas Ed- Edgerton, thanks so much for being with us, sir. You bet. Thanks for having me. Great talking with you.